the whole world watched as the Soviet Union sprinted from communism to freedom and the free market. Moscow is a boom town. If you want to earn a million in this country, you can do it. Communism has given way to capitalism on a grand scale. But Russia's newfound wealth conceals a darker truth. Its paramount leader, Vladimir Putin, has absolute power. In my opinion, Vladimir Putin is a typical control freak. Tell your leaders that this regime is criminal, is a police state. For Putin, it's about power. For people that surround Putin, it's about money. And the Russian people are letting him have his way. The masses want a czar, and this is no joke. Join us as we peel back the layers of Vladimir Putin's Russia. Welcome to democracy, Russia style. Politics spill into the street, and President Vladimir Putin's most outspoken opponent is arrested one week before the elections. Over at Putin's party convention, a fanfare for the party in power, United Russia, the only one that really counts. And the only question, is Russia practicing real democracy or, as critics charge, a carefully orchestrated show? This forest of cameras is not just for the convention delegates. We've just heard that in five minutes, President Putin is going to address this convention. Now, although he cannot run again, at least not immediately, according to the Constitution, he's coming here to rally his political troops because he wants them to continue the Putin plan. And he delivers a bombshell. I am honored to head the candidate list of United Russia. Vladimir Putin signals he has no intention of giving up power, but he might swap jobs from president to prime minister, or he might continue running things behind the scenes. Nobody knows. This intrigue will be alive uh, until the very end of this, uh, of this uh, story. Konstantin Kosachev is one of Putin's party leaders. You know that it's pretty unpopular in the West, this power grab in Europe, in the United States, people are looking at it with alarm. We have not started a single war or a military operation anywhere. Why do Americans, for example, need their bases in Romania, in Bulgaria? Why do they need this uh, anti-missile shield in Poland and Czechia? So I asked him about Russia's provocative moves. For instance, its strategic bombers approaching the coast of America and that of its allies. Why do you think Russia has scrambled fighter jets and sent them close to England and close to the Alaskan coast? In almost 15 years, there were no flights and we do not have uh, experienced uh, pilots for these uh, aircrafts. But why are they going close to England and America? There's plenty of Russian territory they can fly over. What's but the point? The point is that they, they need to have training in, 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 in a real situation. Stop the Cold War. It's our point. We stop it already. Stop the Cold War in your mind. Gosh, everybody thinks it's Vladimir Putin that's restarting the Cold War. Not everybody thinks it's Vladimir Sergei Markov was also running for election with Putin's party. What is the state of relations between Russia and the United States right now? I think now Russia or United States relations are in trouble. And despite the increasingly aggressive posture towards the United States, the president's bid to restore Russia's pride and power is enormously popular here, even if it does come at the cost of rolling back democracy. And the Putin plan uh, is, uh, is to keep all the people in their places. Masha Gaida's party was once a major democratic force, but did not get any seats in the next parliament because the Kremlin kept tightening the rules. So all these years after the end of communism and all these hopes of democracy in Russia, is it basically just a one-party state now? It's a state of 
Putin's administration. Not a party, it's not a party, it's a group of people that nobody knows. It's a group of people sitting in the Kremlin, working there, that are not politicians, that were not never ever elected. It's a, it's a state of Putin. It's not a and state a state of fear uh, for those who dare challenge Putin. Putin. For example, Former KGB agent Alexander Litvinenko had accused President Putin of silencing his critics. A month later in London, Litvinenko was dead. On the anniversary of his murder, his widow's attorney claimed they'd identified the Russian nuclear plant that had produced the radioactive polonium that killed him. Russian authorities have consistently denied any involvement. Britain has charged Andrei Lugovoy, also a former KGB officer with the murder, and wants him extradited. But Putin's government has refused. Litvinenko was always trying to poke his nose into places where a normal person wouldn't. So I can't rule out that Litvinenko found polonium somewhere, started playing with it and had an accident, leading to his death. And far from being a wanted man in Moscow, Lugovoy is something of a hero. He's even running for parliament. Here, even the wealthiest Russians, known as oligarchs, have discovered that if they're foolish enough to challenge Vladimir Putin, not even their billions can protect them. Mikhail Khodorkovsky was once the richest man in Russia. Now he languishes in a Siberian jail, convicted of tax fraud. Trumped up charges, says his lawyer, Karina Moskolenko. He is serving his sentence because these authorities want him to be in jail. But he was funding opposition groups, anti-Putin groups. The only thing he wants in his country to have real democracy. Nothing has done more damage to democracy than silencing Russia's free press and the murder of journalists like Anna Politkovskaya, the country's most famous investigative reporter. When somebody like Anna Politkovskaya is killed, when somebody like Mikhail Khodorkovsky is exiled and jailed, what signal is being sent? Uh, very simple. If you kill the most brave journalist, if you kill this, precisely this person, uh, then others would feel uh, them even more vulnerable and they would think twice. Today, Russia is one of the most dangerous places in the world for journalists. Uh, Ivanov was shot, uh, Sidor was stabbed. When we return, who is behind this mysterious epidemic? This is a beautiful picture of a beautiful girl, a pioneer leader. Her name was Anna Politkovskaya. She grew up in an era when communism was still glorified and the Soviet Union still a superpower. And like all good citizens, she started out as a young pioneer. Anna was always top of her class and Elena Morozova was her best friend. Everybody waited if the tasks were really difficult. And then she sent a small message with the correct answers and everybody was copying. <laughs> so that's why her place as well is this, right in the center. And Politkovskaya remained at the center of things once the Soviet Union collapsed, becoming a crusading journalist. She always wanted to find justice. Anna Politkovskaya became a reporter for the newspaper Novaya Gazeta. In her book, she blasted President Vladimir Putin for snuffing out Russia's democracy. As the most vociferous critic of Russia's brutal war in Chechnya, the breakaway republic, Politkovskaya investigated the corruption of local leaders installed by Russia and the terrible price paid by civilians in the pacification campaign. 
will always say, Anna, stop, it's kind of addiction. You can't risk your life all the time. Think about yourself, think about the kids. Now I realize that she never parted with the heroes of her stories. In her diary, she agonized over official indifference to the victims of the spreading war, who were calling her because no one else was listening. In this entry at 11 p.m., she wrote, women were screaming into the telephone, help us do something, we're lying on the floor with the children. I could hear the rattle of rifle fire. Putin's government didn't want the public receiving any more bad news about Chechnya, and Anna's voice was increasingly isolated. On October 7, 2006, it was silenced forever. These CCTV cameras showed that Anna was followed into the lobby of her apartment building, where she was shot four times at point-blank range. I heard that news on the radio. I couldn't believe my ears. People felt united in their rage that something terrible happened. And she was, I mean, defending so many people and nobody could defend her. Politkovskaya was only the latest in a long list of journalists killed in Russia since the fall of communism. Two of them are chief editors of the one and the same newspaper. Ivanov was shot, uh, Sidorov was stabbed. Alexei Simonov keeps track of the grim body count, and he tries to get each killing investigated. How many journalists have been killed since 1991, since the Yeltsin period? 220. 220, 220 journalists. 220 journalists. And of those, how many have been properly investigated? Oh, five. Five? Or six. Out of 220? Yeah. Simonov says Russian police solve 80% of the murders here, but only 6% when they involve a journalist. They don't think that journalists are really useful in this country. Sometimes they even think that they are uh, worse than useless. Why? Well, because they, uh, they try to find out real things. Is the Kremlin responsible for the deaths of people like Anna Politkovskaya? I don't think that anybody in Kremlin could be uh, accused of being responsible. But the climate in the country is their responsibility. The climate which says that... Don't go against us, don't go into details, etc., etc. All these things is a part of the climate, and the climate is a part of what killed her. The Kremlin denied any involvement in her murder. This journalist was a harsh critic of the Russian government. But her influence on political life here was insignificant. This is a cruel assassination of a woman, a mother, directed against the current Russian leadership. Last August, Putin's prosecutor general said he had cracked the case, even arresting state security officers. But they insist the plot was hatched by Putin's opponents overseas. It seems that Mr. Putin was really interested who killed Politkovskaya, whether it was his left foot or his right hand. Today, journalist Yulia Latinina is one of the few uncensored voices remaining on Russia's airwaves. Her show airs on a radio station called Moscow's Echo. Do you think the investigation is going to reveal who killed her and why? The investigation uncovered as a fact that two teams of people were following Politkovskaya. There were FSB colonels. There were people from police uh, who were watching her movements. Okay, that's not the way a private killer goes about the business. If they're trying to shut up and close down critical journalists, how does Moscow Echo, which is so outspoken, stay on the air? Putin can afford anybody who cries in the corner. He cannot afford this to be on TV. But in the corner, why not? So you're he safe in care. your corner? Oh, I don't think we are very safe, <laughs> really. Next, Putin's most outspoken opponent. Fear is the best way to run the country. Fear is for them. But you have to restore fear. World chess champion Garry Kasparov 
plans his next move. From home on this quiet Moscow street, one man hopes to spark a democratic revolution. So we're now going into the house of Garry Kasparov, the grand chess master, who is going to be figuring out tactics now to try and put his stamp on, some kind of opposition stamp on Russian politics. How are you? Garry so Kasparov has just been named the presidential candidate of the anti-Putin movement called the Other Russia. I think you can't use words candidate, running, elections. None of those normal democratic words? No, no. No, for the government, there's a cover-up. For us, you know, it's a fight for principles. You say you want to fight for your compatriots and for your country, but it looks like about 80% of your compatriots in your country are quite happy with Putin. Yeah, but again, we're talking about the polls taken in the country that has no free press and uh, uh, has a lot of fear. And this is fear in action. One week before the elections, riot police arrest Garry Kasparov, charging him with leading an unsanctioned political rally and chanting anti-government slogans. A hastily convened court sentenced him to five days in prison. Earlier, we had followed Kasparov's attempt to register other Russia's candidates, a coalition of Putin's opponents from left, right and center. This is what the democratic opposition in Russia amounts to these days, a few dozen of Kasparov's die-hard loyalists trying to get themselves on the ballot for Russia's next elections. The question is, what will be their biggest obstacle, the Putin government, or the indifference of the Russian people. Do you know Kasparov? Of course. Yes? He'd be better off sticking to chess. Kasparov emerges from the election commission through a throng of foreign press. For Russian television, this event didn't even happen. Did you get on the ballot? No, 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 no of course not. Nobody can be on the ballot unless Kremlin allows you to be there. So if you're not on the ballot, and you're not able to get on television and you can barely raise money, what can you do and what's the point? The, the point of what we're doing is this, is to show that there is an alternative. But his alternative movement has been harassed every step of the way. They're holding Evgenia Stakov, delegate of Aza Russia. Here, 18 of his delegates were swept into this armored vehicle. But the presence of our cameras got one of them released on the spot. What happened? Why did they take you in? I don't know. I was just walking by when they saw my blue folder and recognized me as a delegate. Is this uh, like the campaign of intimidation? Yes, it's supposed to play with people's minds. This campaign of intimidation has been led by pro-Kremlin youth groups, the so-called Putin youth. You will never succeed in making a revolution in this country. You will never succeed in imposing America's government here. America's government? What is Maxim Mishchenko talking about? We came here to show the U.S. Embassy that this is how things look to us. This is how America screams and squeals. He's the leader of one of the youth groups called Rossiya Molodaya, or Young Russia. We saw you outside the American embassy at a demonstration carrying a pig. Why so bitter? These piglets symbolize Russians who look for directions from the United States. These people don't understand that their political positions will pollute their own backyard. So you think any opposition here, like Garry Kasparov, has to be an American agent? 
Гарри Каспаров. Гарри Каспаров is an honorary U.S. citizen. He loves that country, not this country. Such people should take no part in the Russian politics. Where does Maxim get these ideas? From President Putin himself. At a pre-election rally, he said the opposition were behaving like jackals. Unfortunately, there are some in this country who scavenge outside the gates of foreign embassies. At these special summer camps, organized by NASHI, the largest pro-Kremlin youth group, 10,000 young Russians enjoy the great outdoors and a healthy dose of political indoctrination. Kasparov and other Russia leaders, for example, are depicted as prostituting themselves for America. Do you think the American administration has a plan against Russia? Mm, yes, I think so. Because Russia has one-third of the world's resources. U.S. needs this oil. If not now, then later. When this happens, the world will be shaken by colossal wars, and I want my people to be ready for this. Putinism is patriotism for this young crowd. Maxim Mishchenko is not just any angry young man. He was candidate for parliament in Putin's party. When we started this battle, we didn't know the enemy within or who feeds the dragon that's trying to destroy our country and drink its blood, our oil. America is feeding the dragon called the other Russia. We went to a youth rally and various different of these sort of Putin youth groups are really demonizing you. Are you not afraid for yourself? Yes, I'm afraid. Everybody understands it's dangerous and staying here doing nothing is totally wrong. So the choice is whether I leave my country or I stay here and fight. Right now we're under threat. Our king can be mated. When we come back, how President Putin reined in Russia's once independent television news, which had been one of the tangible triumphs of Russian democracy. In my opinion, Vladimir Putin is a typical control freak. The Kremlin, the mighty fortress at the heart of Moscow, is the ultimate symbol of absolute power. But when Vladimir Putin first strode up this red carpet almost eight years ago, it capped a meteoric rise from political obscurity. When it was announced that Vladimir Putin is uh, Russia's new prime minister, most people say, Vladimir who? Back then, Yevgeny Kiselyov was Russia's leading television news anchor at the major news network NTV. And this is how NTV's satirical puppet show Kukli introduced Putin. Yanked out of obscurity to run Russia by an ailing president Boris Yeltsin, who was incapacitated by illness and alcohol. But once Putin took over, Kukli's days were numbered. The man behind the puppets was Viktor Shenderovich. You can't be an authoritarian leader if people on television are pointing the finger at you and laughing. Like in this episode called Groundhog Day, a dazed Putin keeps waking up to the same news bulletins, announcing his plans to end corruption and the Chechen war. But nothing ever changes. But in reality, Putin would soon change everything. Like coverage of the disastrous Chechen war, Russia's Vietnam. Under Boris Yeltsin, NTV reporters were fiercely independent. But Putin kept NTV and other Russian media outlets far from the action. When Yeltsin left office and Putin came in, NTV immediately came under attack, which was probably the first political campaign that was uh, 
launched by uh, Putin as president of Russia. Shenderovich says NTV staffers were given an ultimatum, surrender your independence or your television station. The three demands were change the critical coverage of the Chechen war, stop telling people about corruption in the Kremlin, and lastly, remove the face of number one from Kukli. When I heard this, I saw it as a creative challenge to write an episode about Putin without Putin. He came up with an episode lifted straight from the Bible, but it couldn't have been more irreverent. I just finished talking to him. Putin was the burning bush, the invisible God laying down the law. The Ten Commandments were, love your president, don't kill anyone except the Chechen, don't steal anything except federal property, and so on. So we revealed their ultimatum and made fun of it. And that was the last straw. The last straw, special police forces stormed NTV's parent company, looking, they said, for proof of financial crimes. Next, Gazprom, the state energy giant, bought out NTV. And that was the end of Yevgeny Kiselyov and his independent news team. What upset Putin so much about your channel, your programs? In my opinion, Vladimir Putin is a typical control freak. Uh, he uh, is obsessive about controlling everything. I think that as a former intelligence officer, uh, he uh, thinks that if you do not control something... That something will control you. That something will control you. Before Kiselyov was forced out, he and his team of journalists had a final meeting with President Putin inside the Kremlin. He said that responsible media should support the president and the government and blah, 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 like, over, like that for three hours. He similarly did not understand us. It was not a conversation, it was a bitter argument. Mm. And Putin did not like that. And he started to to talk to us as if we were his enemies. But Putin soon discovered that the camera could be his friend. Television camera loves him. His popularity after just a number of uh, very successful appearances on television started to grow like this. Television was uh, the tool of his rise to power. And that's why uh, Putin was so keen to control it. When we come back, why the Russian people seem so willing to go along as Putin consolidates his power and silences his critics. Fashion Week in Moscow a chance for Russian models and young designers to strut their stuff. And among these trendsetters are some of President Putin's biggest fans, like fashion editor Evelina Khromchenko. Putin's image, it is very strong and I love it. He understands that his appearance is very important for the country. I'm extremely happy that now, in Putin's era, Russia is not equal to mafia, to caviar and to vodka. We have something more in my country to show to the world. Something to show the world, like this wild club scene on opening night. Alex Shumsky produces Fashion Week. Russia is open now, so it's, it's quite important to let people know outside of Russia the, and to crush st stereotypes. He's married to Evelina, and together they are Moscow's most fashionable power couple. When Putin came to power, and you know, after a few years, uh, everybody uh, got the feeling that uh, stability arrived. Putin means stability. Under Putin, Russia has gone from rags to riches, and the government is flush with the profits of the private energy companies it's taken over. When oil prices surged past $70 a barrel, Putin's approval rating soared up to 70%. Today, Russia is one of the top markets for luxury goods. While the rich get ridiculously rich, 
The average Russian's personal income has doubled as well. The chaos and poverty of the 90s, Russia's first decade of democracy, is just a bad memory. What can you say? It's very difficult to control this country if you're being uh, nice, really 100% democratic. I believe you have to be strong and, uh, and very tough. So now that there's plenty to go around, Rustam Topchev, like most Russians, are more than willing to go along. I like Putin's Russia because it gives opportunities. I do still remember the time of the Soviet Russia. And as soon as you enter the shop, you could see only butter lying there, nothing else. Rustam, chief marketing manager with a major property company, enjoys a cappuccino in a chic cafe as he waits to meet his client, Starbucks. I started working at the biggest bank in Russia. My salary actually was $300 per month, which wasn't enough for me because there were girls, they were, <laughs> they were traveling, there were, were all this kind of stuff. And my, 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 my friends used to, used to have more money than me. So I thought, man, you need to think over and you need to develop. And as Rustam learned, you have to jump at every opportunity. Once uh, I came to the basketball court with, with my friend and I've seen him wearing new sneakers. And I said, hey man, where, where do you get money to, to buy these ones? And he said, my brother invited me to work in a real estate company. Uh, it's a good field to earn money. Would you like to join us? And I thought, if you want to develop, you got you to take steps. You got to move. The more you work, the better results you get. But you get them in future. I do believe that uh, today we're making future. This is Moscow's communist past. And this is Moscow today. The traffic is really bad nowadays. Rushing headlong into its capitalist future. If you want to earn a million in this country, you can do it. I'm more than sure that there are people who sit near the TV set the whole day and uh, speaking with themselves about uh, how bad is their life. I don't have time for that because I have a lot of things to do. And so does Evelina Khromshenko. She has three minutes to finish her editorial before the presses roll out the latest edition of the glossy fashion magazine L'Officiel. Like the high-powered fashion editor in the film The Devil Wears Prada, Evelina's style is take charge. In fact, she was the voice of Meryl Streep's character in the Russian version of the film. Russian editor-in-chief is much more busy. It's time for Evelina to get back on the set of Fashion Court. It's a television game show that tries to teach Russians that even babushkas can have style. Evelina prosecutes women who are accused of fashion crimes by their family and friends. Imagine the friends and relatives says, well, you are not good looking, you are not fashionable, you must change yourself. And this is channel one. This is the most important channel in our country. Uh, in the end of the program, the hero is totally changed and the hero is totally beautiful. And uh, when he or she looks on herself into the mirror, she understands she has a right to be beautiful. And this is the most important item of our program. We must show that every woman is a queen. For Rustam and his friends, nothing's more important than tonight's Russia versus England soccer match. Not even elections and the battle for democracy. Ah. Take a look at the elections. Everything will be solved up there without me. There is no opposition in this country. Everything is formed. Everything is under control. And especially tonight, it's soccer, not politics, that gets them cheering. I like being a resident of this country nowadays. Russia has just pulled off a stunning upset against the star-studded England team. Russia! 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 Coming up, who represents the future of Russia? Those celebrating their president's birthday or those mourning the death of Russia's conscience? I can come to this place and say, Anna, we did at least this.
It's exactly one year since Anna Politkovskaya was murdered, simply for doing her job. On this wet and gloomy anniversary in Moscow, colleagues from her newspaper pay tribute at her graveside. And then they gather at the paper to reminisce about all that she meant and all that they have lost. Corruption has infected the whole system, from street sweeper to the president. Anyone who tries to disturb the system just gets swept away. It's the first of many commemorations honoring her life and her work. These are the images from Russia's open wounds, from the war zones that Politkovskaya visited to tell the victims' stories. Anna Politkovskaya was not an ordinary person. She was a journalist who was not afraid of telling the truth and trying to change the country. For us, she is an authority, an example to try and copy. Unlike this journalism student, most young Russians have probably never heard of Anna Politkovskaya. Hardly surprising. On this day, the TV networks had something more important to report. In a remarkable coincidence, Anna Politkovskaya's murder happened on the same day as President Putin's birthday. Now, on the one-year anniversary, the Putin youth have organized into big rallies, celebrating their hero. Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday, Mr. President! <laughs> Happy birthday to you! We want to support him and ask him to stay for a third term because we know that with him everything will be okay in Russia. The bubbly at this meeting of the Putin fan club is non-alcoholic. Nobody here is old enough to drink. We're happy with him. Uh, we love him. And so does Maxim Mishchenko, the leader of Young Russia. He and his group formed a birthday smiley face. But they are given to sinister conspiracy theories. They even believe Politkovskaya's murder was part of a U.S. plot to discredit Russia. We are convinced Putin couldn't have given an order on his birthday to kill a journalist. People from the opposition did it, or those who pay them. This kind of talk makes former national news anchor Yevgeny Kiselyov very nervous. The government now needs an enemy. When uh, the government starts to uh, indoctrinate a whole generation, uh, then it starts to poison the minds of a whole generation of youth, this is very dangerous. Meanwhile, Russian TV showed President Putin receiving birthday congratulations from the power elite, much like in the old days. The masses want a Tsar, and this is no joke. Eight years ago we did it as satire. But now it's reality. A reality that Viktor Shenderovich continues to make fun of. Only now on radio, because he's been pushed off national television. I am not sad about what happened to me. I am sad about what happened to Russia. In countries where you can't make fun of its leaders, like North Korea or Stalin's Russia, people live poorly, and eventually some of them don't live at all. This is the last picture well, from the uh, supermarket cameras. CCTV cameras? Yes, CCTV cameras. Anna Politkovskaya's son Ilya has just published What For? his mother's final book. And we're sure that uh, World War my mother was killed is inside that book, definitely. Did she discuss President Putin? Uh, yes, she was uh, blaming him for the situation with the human rights in Russia, personally him. Today, Politkovskaya's fate has become the rallying cry for those protesting the assault on human rights and on democracy in Russia. 
We will not forget and we will not forgive. We will come to these people and they'll bear the responsibility for all their crimes. I came because my heart aches and because of what's happening in the country. A horrible, oppressive regime rules the country and all our liberties are ruined. But we are thinking of our grandchildren, so we'll carry on. Gary Kasparov chose a quieter protest, putting up an unauthorized plaque outside the building where Politkovskaya was gunned down. Gary, what does it say? It says, in this house, uh, it's, it's a little bit odd, you know, in English. Anna Politkovskaya lived and was killed here. Her friend and lawyer, Karina Moskalenko, is still fighting for Anna's name. Yesterday, uh, at one o'clock in the morning, we finished our complaint to the European Court of Human Rights, and now I can come to this place and say, Anna, we did at least this. It's difficult, it's still difficult. Yeah, and it's either the sad irony or, or a horrible coincidence or um, a conspiracy that she was killed at the day of uh, Putin's Thursday. Whatever happens, those two events now are stuck to each other in the history books. The day Putin was born and Politkovsky was murdered.